beginning of this year that is 2022 just as covid pandemic was receding the war in ukraine overwhelmed the world in a black swan moment and fundamentally altered the global economic outlook surges in food and energy prices and shortages in key staples have severely affected the poorer sections across the world though international food energy and other commodity prices have moderately in recent times inflation remains high and broad based and this is something which we see world over the imf has projected that more than one third of the global economy will contract this year or next year while no country is spared the ill effects of such large shocks emerging market economies that is emes in particular the ones dependent on food energy and commodity imports have been the worst affected looking beyond the pandemic and the war fragmentation in trade finance and technology is also adding to the forces of deglobalization supply chains are being redrawn on considerations of geopolitical security leading to what is now come to be known as reshoring and friend shoring food and energy security together with climate change have become the biggest challenges to the world in this hostile international environment the indian economy remains resilient drawing strength from its macroeconomic fundamentals our financial system remains robust and stable and corporates are healthier than before the crisis bank credit is growing in double digits for 8 months now india is widely seen as a bright spot in an otherwise gloomy world yet our inflation remains elevated as in most parts of the world global spillovers continue to impart volatility and uncertainty let me now focus on the deliberations and the decision of the monetary policy committee meeting and this is something which i think uh, the key thing about which the market is uh, uh, eagerly awaiting now the monetary policy committee meeting met on 5th 6th and 7th december based on an assessment of the macroeconomic situation and its outlook the mpc decided by a majority of five members out of six to increase the policy repo rate by 35 basis points to 6.25% with immediate effect now i think this is one occasion where the market expectations and the decisions of the monetary policy committee are by and large aligned and there are several interpretations whether when the market expectation and the monetary policy decisions are aligned whether they are you know they have to be taken as a perfect monetary policy or otherwise but that debate can happen some other time now consequent to this increase in the policy repo rate by 35 basis points the standing deposit facility that is the sdf rate stands adjusted to 6% and the marginal standing facility rate and the bank rate to 6.5% the mpc also decided by a majority of 4 out of 6 members to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation to ensure that inflation remains within the target going forward while supporting growth let me now elaborate on the mpc's rationale behind these decisions uh, these decisions relating to the policy rate and the stance of the monetary policy growth prospects across the world are dampening financial markets remain nervous and are characterized by high volatility and price swings for the indian economy the outlook is supported by good progress of rabi sowing sustained urban demand improving rural demand a pickup in manufacturing rebound in services and robust credit expansion consumer price inflation moderated to 6.8% year on year in october as expected but still it remains above the upper tolerance band of the target core inflation is exhibiting stickiness while headline inflation may ease throughout through the rest of the year and in first quarter of 22 20, first quarter of uh, 2023 24 it is expected to rule above the target 
the medium term inflation outlook is exposed to heightened uncertainties from geopolitical tensions, financial market volatility and the rising incidence of weather related disruptions. On balance, the MPC was of the view that further calibrated monetary policy action is warranted to keep inflation expectations anchored, break core inflation persistence and contain second round effects. I would read this sentence again. The MPC was of the view that further calibrated monetary policy is warranted to keep number one inflation expectations anchored, number two break core inflation persistence and number three contain second round effects. These actions will strengthen the medium term growth prospects of the Indian economy. Accordingly, the MPC decided to increase the policy repo rate as I have said by 35 basis points to 6.25 percent and to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation while supporting growth. As regards the stance of the monetary policy, the MPC took a holistic view of the policy rate and the liquidity conditions relative to inflation. Adjusted for inflation, the policy rate still remains accommodative. Over the next 12 months, inflation is expected to remain higher than 4 percent target. System liquidity remains in surplus with an average daily absorption under the liquidity adjustment facility that is LAF of 1.6 lakh crore in November this year. The overall monetary and liquidity conditions remain accommodative and hence the MPC decided to remain focused on withdrawal of accommodation. I would now like to provide our assessment of growth and uh, inflation. First, I will take up growth. According to the latest data released by the National Statistical Office that is NSO, the real gross domestic product posted a growth of 6.3 percent year on year in the second quarter of this year, driven primarily by private consumption and investment. This is also in this also is in line with our expectations. Going into the third quarter of this year, economic activity continued to gain strength in the month of October. Urban consumption firmed up further, driven by sustained recovery in discretionary spending, especially on services such as travel tourism and hospitality. Passenger vehicle sales and domestic air passenger traffic posted robust year on year growth. Rural demand is recovering as reflected in the pace of tractor and retail two wheeler sales with rising farm activity. Investment activity is also gaining traction. Non-food bank credit and this is something very important. Non-food bank credit rose by rupees 10.6 lakh crore during April to November as compared with an increase of 1.9 lakh crore last year. The total flow of resources to the commercial sector, the total flow of resources to the commercial sector expanded by rupees 14.7 lakh crore during this year up to November as compared with rupees 6.8 lakh crore in the same period last year. On the other hand, the drag from net external demand further accentuated in October as merchandise exports contracted by 12.1 percent year on year after expanding during the, pre uh, during the previous 19 months. Merchandise exports expanded by 10 percent in October. On the supply side, the agricultural sector remains resilient. Rabi sowing got off to a strong start. The area so sown so far is 6.8 percent higher than the normal sown area and this is the position as on 2nd December uh, this year. The manufacturing PMI rose from 55.3 in October to 55.7 in November. The PMI for the services sector also expanded from 55.1 in October to 56.4 in November. Incidentally, both manufacturing and services PMIs for India in November are among the highest in the world. 
construction activity is picking up after the end of the southwest monsoon as indicated by high growth of steel consumption in the month of October. Going ahead, investment activity will get support from government capex. A pickup in share of fixed assets in total assets of manufacturing companies was visible in the first half of this year. I have given the data in the footnote of my statement and the statement as you know will be uploaded in our website immediately after my statement is over. You could have a look at the numbers. According to our surveys, consumer confidence has further improved. I go on, manufacturing and infrastructure sector firms are optimistic about the business outlook. Services sector firms also expect activity to expand. In an interconnected world, we cannot remain entirely decoupled from the adverse spillovers from global slowdown and its negative impact on our net exports and overall economic activity. The biggest risks to the outlook continue to be the headwinds emanating from protracted geopolitical tensions, global slowdown and tightening global financial conditions. Taking these factors into, con into consideration, real GDP growth for the current year that is 2022-23 is projected at 6.8 percent with the Q3 at 4.4 percent and Q4 at 4.2 percent. The risks are evenly balanced. Real GDP growth is projected at 7.1 percent in the first quarter of next financial year that is 23-24 and 5.9 percent in the second quarter of the next financial year. Now let me highlight and stress that even after this, you know, even after this marginal revision in our growth projection for 22-23, as you know earlier we had projected 7 percent, now we are marginally moderating it to, uh, to 6.8 percent for the current year. Now even after this reduction or revision, even after this revision in our growth projection for 2022-23 that is the current year, India will still be among the fastest growing major economies in the world and that is something which I think needs to be uh, kept in mind. Let me now turn to inflation. The inflation trajectory has largely evolved in line with the outlook given by us in the month of June, that is in the June uh, 2022 policy. Going forward, food inflation is likely to moderate with the usual winter softening and the likelihood of a bountiful rubby harvest. But pressure points remain in the form of prices of cereals, milk and spices, uh, in the prices of, uh, sorry, in the prices of cereals, milk and in the prices of cereals, milk and spices in the near term. The main risk is that code inflation, that is CPI excluding food and fuel remains sticky and elevated. Overall, CPI price momentum remains high. Risks from adverse weather events add uncertainty to the outlook. Global commodity prices including crude oil have undergone some downward correction. But uncertainty continues to surround the near term outlook in view of the prolonging of geopolitical hostilities. The outlook for the US dollar and hence imported inflation also remains uncertain. Moreover, the resurgence in domestic services sector activity could also lead to price pressures especially as firms pass on the input costs. Taking into account these factors and assuming an average crude oil price that is Indian basket of $100 per barrel, headline inflation is projected at 6.5%. 7% for the current year with the third quarter at 6.6% and the fourth quarter at 5.9%. The risks are evenly balanced. CPI inflation for the first quarter of next financial year that is 23-24 is projected at 5% and the second quarter of next financial year at 5.4% on the assumption of a normal monsoon. Now, Now, what do these growth and inflation scenarios convey? 
Let me summarize. GDP growth in India remains resilient and inflation is expected to moderate. But the battle against inflation is not over. Pressure points from high and sticky core inflation and exposure of food inflation to international factors and weather related events do remain. While being watchful of the impact of our earlier monetary policy actions, we will call, sorry, we will keep Arjuna's eye on the evolving inflation dynamics and be ready to act as may be necessary. Our actions will be nimble and in the best interest of the economy. The aspect of growth will obviously be kept in mind. Now over the last uh, few days and as usual at the time of every monetary policy, pre or post monetary policy discussion, uh, there is a lot of discussion in the media, in the, you know, among various uh, informed circles, whether the RBI statement is hawkish or dovish or otherwise. Now, I leave it to you to interpret what, whether it is a hawkish statement or a dovish statement or, you know, it is something else. But so far as we are concerned, I would like to state that the growth continues to maintain resilience. 6.8 percent in the current context when the rest of the world there is acute slowdown of growth, a 6.8 percent is a very strong growth impulse. That is something, the first point. Second thing is that the problem of inflation is not over. So therefore, the battle against inflation has to continue and we will, we are in a state of, we will monitor all the incoming data. We will also continuously assess the future outlook and we stand ready to act as may be necessary from time to time. The focus on inflation control continues and there will be no let up in our efforts to bring down inflation to more manageable levels and as we have said, first to below 6 percent that is within the target range and then move closer towards 4 percent target. So this is in the para 15 of my statement. Those of you who are interested could again refer to para 15 of my statement, which I think really summarizes all that we have been trying to say in this uh, monetary policy statement. Uh, I would now like to move to the liquidity and financial market conditions. Overall system liquidity remains in surplus. During October, November, the average total absorption under the liquidity adjustment facility was 1.4 lakh crore down from the average of rupees 2.2 lakh crore during August, September. In the period ahead, liquidity conditions are likely to improve due to several factors which would include moderation in currency in circulation in the post festival period, pickup in government expenditure in the last few months of the financial year and higher forex inflation due to the return of portfolio investors. Tax outflows and currency demand do produce transient episodes of tight liquidity, but a holistic view needs to be taken. I reiterate that the Reserve Bank remains nimble and flexible in its liquidity management operations to meet the requirements of the productive sectors of the economy. Therefore, Although the Reserve Bank remains in absorption mode, we are ready to conduct, conduct LAF operations that inject liquidity as may be needed through our main operations. In doing so, however, we will look for a durable sign of a turn in the liquidity cycle when banks draw down large part of their standing deposit facility and variable rate reverse repo, that is V triple R balances. The Reserve Bank remains committed to flexibility and two-sidedness in liquidity operations. But market participants must win themselves away from overhang of liquidity surpluses. As part of our gradual move towards normal liquidity operations, we have decided to restore market hours, that is 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. in respect of call, notice, term money, commercial paper, certificates of deposit and repo in corporate bond segments of the economy as well as for the rupee interest rate derivatives. The pace of transmission of monetary policy actions to lending and deposit rates has quickened in the current tightening phase beginning May 2022. 
the weighted average lending rate that is the WLR on fresh and outstanding rupee loans, fresh and outstanding rupee loans have increased by 117 and 63 basis points respectively during the period May to October. On the deposit side, the weighted average domestic term deposit rate on fresh and outstanding deposits have increased by 150, 150, 150 basis points and 46 basis points respectively during the same period that is from May to October. We are keeping a close watch on this process of transmission. The appreciation of the US dollar this year which precipitated large scale depreciation of all major currencies including the Indian rupee has drawn wide attention. It is important to make an objective assessment of the movement of the Indian rupee in the context of global and domestic macroeconomic developments and financial market conditions. Through this episode of the US dollar appreciation, the Indian rupees movements have been the least disruptive relative to the peers. In fact, the Indian rupee has appreciated against all other major currencies except a few. Cross country comparisons of exchange rate movements are often made on inflation adjusted basis or what is called in real effective terms. On a financial year basis that is from April this year to October, the Indian rupee has appreciated by 3.2 percent in real terms, even as, even as several major, major currencies have depreciated. The story of Indian rupee has been one of India's resilience and stability. As stated by me in a recent speech, the terminal rate for the US Fed is anybody's guess. But it cannot be a case that their monetary policy will be tightened endlessly. When the tightening is over, the tide will surely turn. Capital flows to India will improve and external financing conditions will ease. In this complex world with both push and pull factors at play, the Indian rupee which is market determined should be allowed to find its level and that is what we have, that is precisely what we have been trying to achieve. We must deal with the current global hurricane with confidence and endurance. I would now like to focus on the external sector. The external sector has been affected by strong global headwinds. Slowing global demand is weighing on our merchandise exports. The growth of merchandise imports is also decelerating. At the same time, the impact of the terms of trade shock due to the war in Ukraine is getting gradually normalized. It is also important to take cognizance of India's innate buffers. The growth of services exports mainly contributed by software, business and travel services remained robust at 29.1 percent in April to October this year. Remittances are scaling new heights and the outlook is optimistic with pickup in activity in the Middle East. According to the latest update of the World Bank, India's remittances are estimated to grow by around 12 percent to 100 billion dollars in 2022 and this is against 89.4 billion dollars in the last calendar year 2021. In the first quarter of this year and very importantly, in the first quarter of this year remittances to India rose by 22.6 percent year on year. The net balances under services and remittances remains in large surplus partly offsetting the trade deficit and this gives us a lot of comfort about the size of our current account deficit. Consequently, even if the current account deficit is higher than what it was in 2021-22, it is eminently manageable and within the parameters of viability. On the financing side, net foreign direct investment that is FDI flows have remained robust and have risen to 22.7 billion dollars during April to October from 21.3 billion dollars in the corresponding period of last year. 
foreign portfolio flows have resumed in recent months and were positive at 11.8 billion during July to 5th December led by equity flows. As a result of the measures announced by the Reserve Bank on 6th July, you will recall on 6th July uh, we had announced a series of measures and that was the time when I think the dollar appreciation had started. So we had announced a series of measures to attract more and facilitate uh, more uh, currency inflows, more forex inflows into India. Now as a result of these measures announced by us on July 6th to enhance forex inflows, new external commercial borrowings that is ECB agreements have been con concluded for 8.6 billion dollars. This includes 5.1 billion dollars which exceed the earlier threshold of 750 million dollars under the automatic route. As you know we enhanced you know what earlier in the automatic route the limit was 750 million dollars we enhanced it to 1.5 billion dollars. The size of forex reserves is comfortable and has also increased. It has gone up from US dollar 524.5 billion on 21st October to 561.2 billion as on 2nd December and that is a substantial increase of uh, nearly about uh, let us say about 36.7 billion dollars the arithmetic you may please uh, check. Uh, now this covers around 9 months of projected imports of 22-23. Further India's external debt ratios are low by international standards. I have given how it is low by international standards in the footnote of my statement. Those of you who are interested may like to have a, a look at it. I would now like to announce certain additional measures. The first one relates to and there are four of them. The first one relates to SLR holdings in held to maturity that is HTM category to provide further flexibility to banks in managing their investment portfolios it has been decided to extend the dispensation of enhanced STM limit of 23 percent up to March 31st 2024. Banks will now be allowed to include securities required between securities acquired between 1st this 1st September 2020 and March 31st 2024 in the enhanced HTM limit. The HTM limits would be restored from 23 percent to 19.5 percent in a phased manner starting from the quarter ending 30th June 2024. The second measure relates to uh, enhancing the mandates of UPI that is uh, unified payments interface. You would have seen that almost in every policy statement we are announcing several measures relating to our payment systems and in with particular focus on the UPI and UPI as you know has emerged is now globally accepted as one of the best uh, payment systems anywhere in the world and it has been our constant endeavor to try and try and improve or, or try and deepen and improve the reach of uh, UPI in India. Now the announcement this announcement relates to enhancing the mandate of UPI payment that is UPI. The UPI has emerged as the most popular retail payment system in India. It is currently it currently includes functionality to process payment mandates for recurring as well as single block and single debit transactions. The capabilities in UPI will be further enhanced by introducing single block and multiple debits functionality. This facility will enable a customer to block funds in his, in his or her account for specific purposes which can be debited as needed. This will significantly enhance the ease of making payments for investments in securities through the retail direct platform as well as e-commerce transactions. The third announcement relates to expanding the scope of the Bharat bill payment system or what we call the BBPS. The BBPS has been steadily expanding since its launch in 2017. At present it handles recurring bill payments for merchants and utilities and does not cater to non-recurring bills. It also does not cater to bill payments or collections such as payments of 
fees for professional services, education fees, tax payments, rent collections, etc. for individuals even if those are of recurring nature. Therefore, the scope of BBPS is being enhanced to include all categories of payments and collections. It includes now both payments as well as uh, collections, both recurring and non-recurring and for all category of billers that is both businesses and individuals. This will make the BBPS platform accessible to a wider set of individuals and businesses who can benefit from the trans, uh, you know, the transparent payments experience, faster access to funds and improved efficiency. The fourth and the final announcement is very important. Uh, hedging of gold that relates to hedging of gold in the International Financial Services Center IFSC. Resident entities in India are currently not permitted to hedge their exposure to gold price risk in overseas markets. With a view to providing greater flexibility to these entities to hedge the price risk of their gold exposures, resident entities will now be permitted to hedge their gold price risk on recognized exchanges in the IFSC. This measure will benefit importers and exporters of gold such as jewelers and industries which use gold as an intermediate or raw material. Let me now try and uh, conclude. The last three years have been unusually challenging as we have encountered multiple shocks. The buffers we built in the years leading to COVID-19 in terms of accumulating reserves and inflation averaging close to the target came good to deal with these repeated shocks. In this arduous period, our constant endeavor has been to take timely and effective measures. It is gratifying to see that our policies have yielded positive results. And just at the cost of repetition, let me say that the growth in India remains resilient in such a hostile environment, international environment, a 6.8 percent growth definitely is robust. Inflation compared to other countries is lower, but so far as India is concerned, we have to focus on our inflation and we are extremely watchful of the evolving inflation dynamics. We constantly in the Reserve Bank, we keep on assessing various incoming data almost on a day-to-day -day basis and as I have said, we are committed to bring it down in the, you know, at a, you know, as I have mentioned first to below 6 percent and then take it closer to 4, 4 percent. We are what we have called, what I have described, we will keep an Arjuna's eye on inflation and this is something which I had explained in one of my earlier speeches and we will be ready to act, our actions will be nimble. The course of our future policy will duly consider new data releases and the evolving outlook of the economy as well as the effect of our past actions. In meeting the challenges thrust upon us by a hostile global environment, we should not lose sight of the task of improving the long-term potential of our country. Green transition, reconfiguration of supply chains and logistics, production link linked incentive schemes, digital banking and financial services, and innovative technologies offer immense opportunities for the Indian economy. As we enter 2023, India's G20 presidency provides us a historic opportunity to play a bigger role in the international arena. The theme of our presidency, Vasudeva Kutumbakam, that is, the world is one family, reflects our vision of global cooperation for universal welfare. We must remain optimistic and derive inspiration from the words of Gandhiji. I quote, let no one think that it is impossible because it is difficult. It is the highest goal and it is no wonder that the highest effort should be necessary to attain it, unquote. As the current year ends and a new one awaits, I wish you all a happy new year in advance. Thank you. Namaskar.